Hello, fellow seekers. I hope you all are doing well. We are going to conclude with the Hannah Payne trial. The prosecution is getting ready to call two witnesses up. The first one is going to be Kenneth Herring's sister. And the other one will be Terry Robinson, the one that was involved, the correctional officer that was involved with most of and witnessed Mr. Herring, you know, obviously in trouble and all that. So that should be very interesting. And I still find Hannah's attorney, I mean, I'm sorry, I just think he's smarmy. That's just my opinion, though. Just remember that because I'm not anything, you know, no lawyer, no doctor, no psychologist. You know, like I said, just a person who loves true crime, wants justice for the victims, and has a lot of opinions. So let's just go on and get on with it. to Kenneth Herring. Yes. And how were you related to Kenneth Herring? I'm his baby sister. Mm. When uh, was Kenneth born? 1956. <laughs> okay. Yes. And how much older was he than you? I was born in 1963. And where did y'all grow up? In Norman Park, Georgia. In the time that you spent around uh, Kenneth, were you ever aware of any medical conditions that Kenneth had? I knew, I know that he was a diabetic, severely. Were you aware of any type of medications or anything that he had to do in order to manage his severe diabetes? He was insulin dependent. And when you talk about insulin dependent, are we talking about pills or injections? Um, he was on injections at the time. You know, that's so sad. You could just see, well, number one, I know she had to have been nervous, but, you know, this poor family has been waiting and waiting for a long time. And when she said she's his baby sister, I kind of like, oh, because it was just my sister and me, and I lost her four years ago. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Around the same time. Well, I don't know. Close. But, um... It was definitely unexpected and sudden, but 
mm, it was a health thing. It was not like this. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't like make the grief any less for sure, but still this is got to make it tougher. So I really, really feel for her and the whole family. All right. Let's hear what Mr. Tucker has to say or ask. Yes, ma'am. Miss Aaron, my condolences to you for your loss. Uh, my name is Matt Tucker. I'm the attorney for uh, Miss Payne over here. And I just have a few questions to ask. Um, what kind of work was Mr. Herring in? He, at the time, he was doing some odd jobs. Okay. Did he wear a suit all the time? I saw the picture of him in a suit. Did he wear a suit all the time, or did he wear kind of work clothes? Or? He wore work clothes when he worked. Okay. And did he do a lot of work in, out of his car? Did he have a bunch of tools and, um, I guess, things to assist him in his, his job? He may have, yes. Okay. You weren't familiar with what was in his truck? No, as I was not there at the time, I, had, I didn't know what was in his truck at the time. And I don't have to just restrict it to that time. Did you ever see his truck? I know that truck because it belonged to my father. Okay. So, um, but you didn't know the contents, what was in the truck, correct? You just knew it was your father's truck passed down? I didn't know what was in the truck at the time. What did he have in his truck other times, do you know? And Judge, around the truck, going to be a lot of items that are shown. I just want to know how long those items were in the truck and people had knowledge of it being in the truck prior to that day. Okay, I'm going to um, sustain the objection and ask you to move on in terms of the questions so I don't find it relevant. Okay. Um, <laughs> you stated that you do. he was diabetic, correct? That's correct. Did he have one of those EpiPens uh, that they would use to inject insulin or to Assist if he was having a flare-up or diabetes, low sugar, high sugar? I had not seen one. I had seen him use a needle. Okay. Did you ever assist him with that needle? I did not. Um, did he ever say he had problems injecting with that needle or any needle? He never disclosed any to me. Okay. And he never said anything about an EpiPen? That would be kind of the alternative of... Taking the needle out, injected himself. I never discussed it with him in depth. Okay. So, you, but you said you knew he had diabetes. I do. And did, were you there at a doctor's appointment when the doctor disclosed, or did he disclose it to you, or he disclosed it to me? Yes. And he never once talked about the epidemic verse and the injection. He did not have that discussion with me. Okay. And. Um, how many times do you see him uh, using the jet or doing injection? Hang on, I gotta move this camera because because I want y'all to see the expression of the prosecutor when he asks questions. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. I saw him on a couple occasions. Okay, do you know how much he had to inject into him, or I do not, and I never asked. I, I, I'm trying to find out. <laughs> She's annoyed. Well, let me know, uh, Attorney S uh, Chief Assistant, to make the objection. And I, I didn't. I stopped. Okay. I stopped. Okay. So, you weren't that familiar with these injections? You just knew that he had done them from time to time, correct? Yes. And um, and you weren't present at the doctor's appointment when he was diagnosed with this or told Asked out and answered. to handle the injections? No. Okay. No further questions. Okay, any redirects from the state? No, Judge. Okay, uh, may this witness step down? We are requesting that she be excused. Okay, that she may uh, remain in the forward. Okay. Any There's no objection. Okay. So you're excused to be in the court. You could tell she was annoyed about Attorney Tucker's questions. So that attorney or district attorney is Nigel, I think I'm saying it right, Nigel Hunter.
Yes, are you going to swear him in ABA Hunter? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Would you raise your right hand? Do you swear and affirm the testimony that you will provide to this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. All right, you may have a seat. Pull yourself up to the microphone. If you feel comfortable, can you remove your mask and talk clearly into the microphone so the court reporter can take down your testimony? If you don't feel comfortable, then just make sure you speak clearly into the microphone. Yes, ma'am. All right, could you please state and spell your name for the record? Terry Robinson, T-E-R-R-Y-R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. And Mr. Robinson, what is your current occupation? I work with the Department of Georgia Department of Corrections. And what do you do for the Georgia Department of Corrections? I work in the uh, infirmary operations, um, securing uh, inmates, managing uh, those particular things that operations will be have for the um, state of Georgia. Okay, and you stated you work in the infirmary. Can you give us kind of your duties and responsibilities and what your day-to-day -day would look like in that role? Well, in that particular role, what we do is manage, make sure that our inmate the offenders are taken care of and they come into our facilities. We generally like to send them like a hospital, but making sure that our operations are making management, making sure that these particular um, offenders are taken care of. That's basically it. Uh, watching over them and keeping them secure. Okay. Do you work closely with any of the nurses in these facilities? Of course. And what are you? What are your duties as far as the nurses are concerned? Um, making sure they're safe. Making sure they're safe. Making sure that nothing takes place with them. Um, watching them as they manage and placement and give out um, medical or assisting the um, offenders as needed. Okay, have you ever been involved with inmates who are having medical conditions? Yes, all the time. I mean, basically when they have certain things, when they happen with them, we call the nurses down to make sure that they see after them and everything. Um, basically, just making sure that the nurses are aware and that the doctors come down to just as well. And have you had the opportunity to just observe the inmates when they're either diagnosed with certain certain conditions or being treated for certain conditions? We do. We pay attention to that, but basically it's when they're saying that this particular um, offender has this particular um, disease or either something taking place with that particular offender, and that's about it. But we don't diagnose it. I'm not a medical. I just make sure that, the, again, making sure that the nurses – and doctors are secured. And how long have you worked in that role with the Georgia Department of Corrections? Eight years. And have you had the occasion to observe patients who were diagnosed with diabetes? Yes, we have. And have you observed um, what physical manifestations may occur in the event that um, someone with diabetes may be having a particular condition or episode when they go in on a certain shock or something like that and basically we did see how they get seizures and stuff that nature and stuff but other than anything else that's severe um mostly the nurses are there to help them give them medication before they go into that certain stage but if they go into a certain thing we observe like some of them may have like yellow eyes uh glassy eyes of that nature and nature and stuff or having a diabetic of a shock or something like that. Now, are you currently post-certified? Yes, I am. And were you post-certified on May 7th of 2019? Yes, ma'am. Now, were you on duty on May 7th, 2019? No, ma'am. I was off duty. That was one of my off days. I was off. So you weren't in uniform? No, ma'am. Now, let's talk about an incident that you witnessed that occurred on May 7th of 2019. Did you witness a vehicle collision on May 7, 2019? Yes, ma'am. And where did that collision occur? Um, Clark Howell and Forest Parkway. And is that location in Clayton County? Yes. And are you familiar with that area? Yes, I am. And how often would you say you've driven in that area? Plenty of times. When it, before even say before the fifth one way came, I've been in uh, Atlanta mostly 38 years, so yes. And do you recall why you were in that area that day? Um, heading home, um, unfortunately, coming up, I was kind of leaving Camp Creek. 
Um, but there was an incident on 285, uh, more than 285. Came across, got on highway, I mean, came on Interstate 85, worked my way around. There was another incident on Riverdale Road, upper Riverdale Road. Worked my way around by towards the uh, airport uh, where the uh, cargo area is. And that's when I took Clark Howell because they were saying 75, 85, there was an accident over there. <laughs> so I worked my way around to come down to uh, Clark Howell. So the traffic conditions were just really horrible hey, on that I, day. I, I, it was weird. I was, I was, I never seen three accidents in one day, but that was taking place and happening. Now, did you witness the entire incident that occurred? Yes, ma'am. Now, can you tell us what happened during that vehicle collision on Clark Howell Wind Force Park? As we were approaching the, um, the, the light, the light was green. The vehicles were turning to the left, and the truck I know was turning right. All of a sudden, I seen this maroon vehicle come, bam, hit the side of the truck. It lifted up, came to a stop. When I was approaching, coming down, I saw the sound of the maroon vehicle, and I saw the gentleman kind of slump over a little bit. That's what made me pull over to see if he was okay. And I, when I got the car, that's when I asked the gentleman if he was okay. And then the uh, truck driver came up next, and then we took, just basically making sure the gentleman was okay. That's when I called 911. All right, so just to be clear, can you describe the vehicles that were actually involved in the collision, what they looked like in their uh, color? Like I said, it was a white 18-wheeler um, truck. I don't know what the name, I forget the name of the truck, but the company, but the maroon vehicle. And I seen the Jeep. And there was another, it was, I think it was another car. I think it was a white car on the other side. So what vehicles actually collided during that incident? The actual collided was the, the maroon, the maroon uh, vehicle and the uh, semi-truck. All right, so you got out of your vehicle um, and tell me what specifically you did once you pulled your vehicle over. Again, once I pulled over, I went to the um, driver who was in the maroon vehicle and asked whether he was okay. Um, he was really confused, dazed. I was looking at him and said, well, you know, do you need any help in the system? That's, again, that's when I called 911, asking if he needed help. And he said, what happened? I said, sir, are you okay? You know, he said, well, I, I, what happened? What happened? I said, sir, you was in a car wreck incident. And then that's when the uh, again, like I said, the other driver came up and said, "Is he okay? Is he okay?" I said, "Well, we'll see if I get in a bus here. We need an ambulance." And that's when I said, well, "Was recorded on a 911 call." That's when I asked for assistance. Now, when you made contact with the driver in the maroon truck, what were your observations of him physically? Physically, the scene that he was like, again out of it. Uh, like I said, I noticed his eyes were a glassy effect. Again, out and. Again, not being a professional uh, a doctor or anything, just saying that was he going through a diabetic situation or whatever. I didn't smell any alcohol on him of that of sort, but I just noted that the gentleman was, you know, out of it. So you didn't smell any alcohol? No, I did not. All right, after you checked on the victim in the, or the driver in the maroon truck, what did you do? Did you check on anyone else? Um, just yes, checked on everyone, make sure they're fine. I noticed Miss um, the uh, other young lady who was driving the Jeep. Asked her if she was okay. She said she was okay because her car vehicle went up on the um, ramp side, and other drivers they were okay. But they, I, some of them just left the scene because they didn't. He did He avoided. They avoided hitting him. So the only one checking on was her and the truck driver. Okay, I'm going to hand you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit 2.
said when making delivery, when I'm going that way of avoiding traffic of a 285 or either uh, 7585, and I'll take this way to, to travel out. So, yes, I'm familiar with this area. Was that the area where the incidents would have occurred? This incident right here, this is Forest Park Bay Phoenix Boulevard. This is where, when I came up, when I left the scene that's further down the way, Clark Howell and Forest Park Bay. That's when I came up and asked what took place in the house because I just seen the scene. And I said, it, 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 some took place with that. You would have traveled that route to get to that location? Yes, I had come from Clark Howell heading west. Get the list of cases because this is the corner where the McDonald's is, and this is 285 right here. Any objection? Okay. Admitted without Your Honor, we will also be submitting State's Exhibit 2A for demonstrative purposes, which is just an enlarged photo of the map that was just submitted into evidence, the State Exhibit 2. All right, Mr. Robinson, can you identify the direction where you would have come from from the initial incident of the vehicle um, uh, accident? I would have, we would have came, I would have came from this direction right here, heading west to this location on this spot. I would have came from west, heading from east, heading west as well. All right, thank you. Now, what damages did you observe to the red maroon truck after the accident? Um, the front end was heavily damaged. Um, radiator fluid, all water was leaking out. Um, as I observed, and everything was heavily damaged to the front. Was the vehicle operable? At the time, it wasn't because it was off. Um, but <laughs> we see it happen that he was able to turn it on and leave the scene. Because I was thinking that, as me and the truck driver, this, this vehicle is not going anywhere. Because that's the scene all that on the floor, on the, on the grounds right there. I assumed that, hey, the vehicle was uh, disabled. Okay, you stated you did um, call 911? Yes, we did. Yes, I did. How many times did you call 911 this day? Twice. Okay. I'm showing you what is the Arkansas State Specific 3. Do you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. What do you recognize that you did? Um, the, the recording of the uh, 911 call. And have you listened to those 911 calls? 
Yes, ma'am. How do you know that these, this is the system to cause Because I initialed it right here. That day, yes. You have permission to publish? Yes. What do you think she's thinking there? Mr. Robinson, why did you continually ask for an ambulance during this 911 call? Concerned about the victim. He was out of it, back and forth, you know, and like I say, he was, you know, his eyes, uh, the way he was carrying on, how he was looking and everything, I was concerned. And I felt like I needed to have an ambulance there to, to observe him. Okay, and after you made that 911 call, um, what other observations did you have of the victim? Um, well, he got the truck. He walked around the vehicle and everything. We were walking around the vehicle just making sure that, you know, 
just walking around. But he didn't, you know, make the attempt and do anything strange at that time, um, where I can recall. Um, and that was basically it. He was just walking around, and I was talking to the other um, person, um, the truck driver, and, and talking to um, this um, young lady there. Um, and that was basically it. And we were just waiting for um, CB, uh, Clayton County to appear, or something. Clayton County or either ambulance to come. Now, after you made the first 911 call, did you have any other communications or conversation with Mr. Heron? When he started to get, you know, when he, he walked, got, back, he was, wait, I'm sorry, he got back into the truck. I'm going to call, he got back into the truck, and I said, well, sir, you okay? Like that, and he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like I said, sir, you can't go anywhere, you know, can't go anywhere. He was in the, he was in the car uh, incident, he can't leave the scene like that. And after that, he just, you know, sitting there. And I'm still talking and talking to them. And all of a sudden, he turned on the vehicle. And I'm like, well, sir, you can't do anything. You can't move. You can't move. And that's when he put it in, put it in dry and floored it. And I was like shocked. I said, well, God, this vehicle, <laughs> I thought it was disabled. And thinking in my mind, I should have took the keys. That came in my mind. The car was the city took the keys or stop. But again, this thing that the vehicle could be disabled, it wouldn't be able to drive off. But right there, that happened. And once Mr. Heron got back in the vehicle, um, when did you make the second call to 911? After that's when he again waiting for them to come, waiting for them to come and everything, and saying, "Hey, they, you know, what's taking them so long?" I understand this incident's taking place, but was taking so long. And then that's when he, that's when, between that time when I made that phone call, that's when he accelerated all. Now, how much time had passed between the first 911 call and the second, your second 911 call? It was like way over 20 minutes. Cause we was trying to figure what was taking so long. Now, did the defendant um, and Mr. Herring ever speak or communicate with each other while they were on scene? No. No, she was standing over there by the truck driver. She had communication with him, just talking to him right there. Um, they did make conversation. And did you secure the area, the scene, to keep people separate and apart? Well, basically when I told them who I was and everything, they're saying I was off-duty officer, state officer, and that was it. Basically, I'm, you know, here, just waiting for the, you know, just here to help and wait for a uh, uh, assistance to come in. Real basically, we're asking for Clayton County or either um, the ambulance to come from that. But everybody was standing where they were. They wasn't. She or he was not near his, um, the driver. So they never exchanged words. No, no not at all. All right, I'm gonna play the your second 911 call. Road. Up a Riverdale Road. That's what he said. 
Robinson, when you stated, take a picture of the tag, take a picture of the tag, who were you talking to? I was talking to um, the driver, the Jeep driver. And do you see that person um, in the courtroom today? Yes. And can you describe her by an article of clothing? Well, can you describe them by an article of clothing they're wearing, identify where they're sitting in the courtroom? Uh, they're sitting over to my right. She has long um, brunette hair and she has um, a blouse on with a cross. All right, let the record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant in open court. Now, when you contacted 911, um, where was the defendant physically at that time? Hey, she was standing off to the side. I mean, she was just standing off to the side over there, just really by herself, standing to the side. Now, when Mr. Heron got in his vehicle, um, where was the defendant physically standing? Or Again, where was she? Again, standing up to the side. She was over there to, towards her vehicle and just standing to the side. Now, when Mr. Heron began to drive off, where was the defendant physically? I didn't, at first, I didn't observe where she was at then. I was focusing on him where he was going, and then all of a sudden I seen her vehicle coming to the side. And then that's again, I said, Yes, go get his tag, get his tag, get his tag. And I was telling her, Get his tag. So was the defendant already in her vehicle? Yes. When you told her to take a picture of the tag? Yes, she was moving. Yes. Now, outside of what we hear on the second 911 call, did you specifically tell the defendant to pursue Mr. Herring? 
the suit. Well, again, told her to go get the tie. So you didn't tell her to? No, I didn't tell her to apprehend or cause to or stop the vehicle so to get a tag, picture of the tag. Because at the time, we didn't have, I didn't have a picture of the tag. So did you tell the defendant to stop Mr. Herring's vehicle if she was able to catch up to him? Oh, uh, no. Did you tell the defendant to use whatever means, including deadly force, to stop Mr. Uh -huh. Herring from getting away? No. Now, did an officer ultimately arrive um, to the incident location? Yes. Now, do you know how soon the officer arrived after the defendant left the scene? It had to be like, if I can recall, at least another 10 minutes. Eight, give or take eight to 10 minutes, because that's when, I, when he rolled up. And he said, um, and I noticed a, a black vehicle heading fast, an uh, SUV heading fast towards on uh, 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 Forest Parkway heading that same direction, the river that road. And then he said, well, there was an incident down there. I said, well, I'm going down there. I'm going to drive down there to see if they caught up with this the person and everything. Because I know the vehicle was coming fast. So I did. That's when I drove down there. And I sent a commotion. And I got up by my apartment vehicle over towards um, McDonald's. I said, what happened? What happened? I said, she shot. I said, who shot who? Your response, No further questions, John. Okay. I will uh, sustain the objection and the trial will disregard the hearsay. Uh, do you have cross-examination? Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. The jury, they've been sitting for a while. I'm going to give a quick break and then allow you to do the cross-examination. So it's 4.15. Um, again, I know some of you have child care um, arrangements to put in place. I'm going to give you an option to do that since you may be here uh, past 5 o'clock. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and it's now 4.15. Just be back at approximately 4.35. Thank you. Okay, I think we're getting ready. There's Judge Scott. Exhibit number two. You look at that um, and make sure that's a correct copy of what you wrote. 
Yes. Does that appear to be a fair and accurate representation of what you wrote in the statement? That's what it says, sir. Does that appear to be your signature? Yes, it is. At this time, Your Honor, I would tender exhibit, defense exhibit number two, which is a written statement from Mr. Officer Robinson on the day of the incident. Any objection from the state? No, I don't. We don't have a projector here, do we? Oh, we do? Okay. statement there, do you recall stating that you saw an accident that occurred at Forest Parkway and Clark Howe Road involving a semi-truck and a Dodge pickup truck? See that later on down there, you say he looked impaired, and at, and you asked him if he was okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Did he say that he needed any medical attention? He was groggy, like and so on, so he wasn't really asking the question, sir. Okay. And you you told him to stay in his truck, correct? I did. And he refused and started walking away. Start walking around. Walking yeah. around. Was he walking around his vehicle or walking, walking around, around his vehicle? Was he looking at the vehicle to see if it was operational, like the tires or the front or the radiation? Again, he was just walking around the vehicle. Okay. And what date was this statement written on? The date is still in right here, sir. 5 7 2019? That's correct. Okay. And. And you stated later on that. Um, there was another person who was involved, a white woman. Was she actually involved in the accident? The, the one that you're describing here. As far as the vehicle is concerned and everything, she, the vehicle almost hit her vehicle. Almost saw, hit yes. the I mean, vehicle. She, she made a maneuver. What I saw was she made a maneuver and she went up, went up. But I was mostly focused on when he hit the vehicle, Hit the semi trailer truck. That was the one he made him back on. Okay. Everybody so, else, unfortunately, he missed. Okay. So, my question was very specific Was she involved in the accident being hit by another vehicle? No. Okay. And this was on the 7th of May, correct? That's correct. All right. Now, did you have another opportunity to talk to the Clayton County Police regarding this accident? That day? We can go that day. Did you have a chance to talk to the uh, detective or anybody else from Clayton County that day? Other than um, after the incident. But do you recall talking to a, a Detective Hayward or a Detective Moore 
on May 21st, 2019? Yes. Okay, and in this interview? I'm not sure the, the day was, but I'm, they called me. If you would like, it can help you refresh your memory with a copy of the transcripts of what was said that day. If it would assist you. That would be fine. Yes, he does. Yes, sir. It should be labeled up in the top left hand corner. The top left hand corner? It would be yeah, page number five. Yes. yes, I see it. Page five. Yes, that's the one I'm going to start referencing. What am I referencing to, sir? Okay. If you could, uh, did I refresh your memory? So you do recall the interview you had with, uh, uh, the detective? Yes, yes, the two detectives. And do you recall in that interview that you said there was a Mr. Kimball, he was the truck driver, and that Miss Payne was present, and that you were speaking to both of them? reference that he keeps walking around, Mr. Herring, and why did you just get back to your truck? Do you remember saying that to the detectives? That's what it stated right here, sir, but that's what took place. Okay. And you said that everybody was just waiting for the Clayton County Police, correct? Yes. Okay. And But they didn't arrive as quick as you wanted. And you came back and said, when asked, this guy was not looking good. They asked, what did you mean by that? Do you recall saying that he is getting irritable? And he said to you, what laws have I broke? Do you recall hearing that from Mr. Herring that day? Oh. I guess it was in the statement right here, sir. That's not how to go by. Okay. And do you recall what you stated to him that you caused this incident? And you need to stay still. 
Just say it right here, so that other than that. Okay. And you recall thinking that you would you should have gotten the keys, or thinking about getting the keys from him, but you didn't feel like going through all of this. Do you recall? The state didn't need this information, sir. That's and do you recall why you didn't want to get involved in all of this? Well, at the time, sir, I, again, I was trying to think. I was, I was there at the location. I was trying to observe, make sure everybody was okay. I was trying to apprehend this person when trying to do that particular thing, thinking that this person was just going through what it was going through. And you were trying to apprehend? No, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wasn't, try again, I wasn't trying to do anything at that age. And that's because you were not in uniform? Um, if I was the, if I would, again, if I was in uniform or something like that, I wasn't expecting that to take the place and happen. Again, I was expecting that um, the system would, I mean, people, the Clayton County would arrive and be there on the scene to take care of the matter and go from there. I was not trying to do anything else, sir. You said that you were trying to keep everybody safe, correct? Yeah, because cars were moving, people were coming, and so I made sure that I asked some people to move to the side and stay still. That's the only thing, because the only reason why, because this gentleman, I feel something was wrong with that person. And he was walking around irritable, so he was out of his truck, correct? If he's walking around, sir, yes. Okay, but the keys were in the truck, correct? Well, at the time, I, I don't know. I mean, here it is. He had out the vehicle. And, again, I did not, after that, I didn't say anything else to do anything else because he was, again, I felt like the vehicle was not able to drive off because the, the damage was occurred to it. So, because it was smoking and it was leaking a bunch of radiation, oil or, or fluids, it's like, you know, he can walk around all at once, that means it's disabled, correct? Mm -hmm. So you would say it was a pretty strong impact on the 18-wheeler based on the damage of the vehicle? Based right? on the damage of the vehicle, yes. And then you stated that if you could go to page number six. You stated that uh, your car is still smoking. You don't want to do that. Um... Is that reference to him getting in that vehicle and driving off? Pretty much. Okay. And that he stated to you like, well, I didn't break any logs or anything. You recall him saying that to you? Yeah, yes, I, yes. I mean, well, just looking at the sleeper right here, yes. And now, Mr. Kimmel with 18, the driver with 18 wheeler, he's standing in front of his vehicle, correct? In front of Mr. Herring's vehicle, damaged vehicle, correct? Yes. And Mr. Hayne was in the gym revving up the engine. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And as he's ramming up, Mr. Kittle's in front of the truck. And you tell him, sir, please, please, don't drive off of it. Don't move the vehicle. Do you recall telling him that? Yes. Okay. And sure enough, he threw it to drive and he drove off. Now, how close was Mr. Kittle to the front of that vehicle when he drove off? Couple of feet away, because okay. I believe you. I'm here, yeah, just a couple of feet away. Okay. And you, you, what was going through your mind was, oh my God, I, I don't see how this thing is driving. Pretty much. Okay. Now, on the 911 tape, you heard yourself saying, "Get a picture. Get a picture of that, quick." Now, were you talking to Mr. Kimball or were you talking to Miss uh, Pay? At the time, I'm talking to Mr. Kimball. That's the name, Mr. Kimball. Were you aware that Miss Payne was on the phone with 911? I was time? not aware or she was on the phone. I know I was on the phone with 911. And did you see her have the phone to her head or did you see her with the phone in her hand? No, I did not. She was actually in her vehicle driving to go behind the car or behind the truck, correct? Correct. And that was you in there saying, go, go, good, go, correct? Yes. Okay, that was directed clearly to Miss Payne, correct? Yes. And you didn't see her after that because she's going to get a picture of the tag, correct? Yes. So do you 
never said anything about please don't pursue, or you never said anything like, hey, be safe, don't do this. I say get the picture of the tag. And you said, go, go, good, go. She's going to get the picture of the tag. Sir, you said a second ago that you said get a picture of the tag to Mr. Kimball, correct? Sir, at the time, at my memory can call, everything was moving fast. He was taking the picture of the vehicle as well as she was coming up driving. And so that's what stated, get a picture of the tag. But you said you didn't see her with a camera in her hand or a phone in her hand, correct? No, the only one I have a picture of, for if I recall, was Mr. Kimball. Uh, his phone in his hand, taking the picture was trying to take a picture anyway. Okay, so, just to clarify, so, you're telling Mr. Kimball to take a picture, and you're telling Miss uh, Payne, good, go, because you only saw her vehicle going after uh, to get a picture of the tag, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you recall telling the detectives in that interview on the 21st after this fact, after you'd seen the, pre the other result of the other incident? That day, you recall telling them, next thing you know, she came around and I said, don't pursue it. Just get his license plate and just come back with the dispatch. Do you recall saying that in your interview to Detective Hayward and Moore? If it's written down here, I'm not going to call it, but I don't recall that. But if it's written down here, I must have probably said it. I'm not sure. But if it's in this incident, if it's affidavit. But on the day of the incident, you don't recall saying that or you didn't hear yourself say that on the 911 tape, correct? No, sir. Okay. And then um, you also said that there was a white driver and a black guy was in a truck with him. And I told him, just get the license plate. Was there somebody else present that uh, was not identified? And it would be in your statements right there, just below what I said about, I told her, don't pursue. Well, of course, it's, for, it's just been a length of time, but yeah, it was. I, I recall, it was another gentleman. He was in the vehicle, and he was over there as well. It was another person in the vehicle, too, as well, because he just pulled up, as I recall, another vehicle pulled up. And you saw him driving off the same direction Ms. Payne was going, correct? He headed that way. Okay, and you said to him, hey, get the license plate, get the license plate. That's pretty much. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and... You said that basically after that all occurred, you kind of drove down to the location that you were identifying on the map there, correct? Correct. And that was the identification of an accident that you did not see, but you came up on it later, correct? Correct. Okay. And you parked over there at McDonald's, and you knew, I guess, an officer from Clayton County. And... You stated to him that all she was supposed to do is just get the license tag plate. Don't do anything crazy. Do you recall saying that to Miss Payne on that I, day? I don't remember call saying that anything to that like that, but I that when I missed the officer. Okay. And um You said you knew that you told the woman, Miss Payne, not to pursue, but just get the license plate? I guess in the midst of a statement, I just addressed the same, addressed the situation, but I didn't make, I guess in the very clear of that, but according to the affidavit, I, I don't recall making that statement right there, but I just made it again. What I said before, to get the license plate out. Because in the hustle and bustle and the rush of what's going on, you had no clue it was going to end up the way it did, correct? No, sir. Okay. So then when you found out it did end up the way it did, you came back and you stated in your interview, you know, it's like it's 
just not worth it. And that is why you said to Ms. Payne, do not pursue him, just get the license plate. Do you see that in fresh memory in the page six of your So I recall that right there. But again, it's written in the statement right here. But you further went on in that interview again and t said, after seeing the end result, that this is totally crazy. I told her all we need is that license plate. Well, what I'm going to say is, and me doesn't remember saying it, but if he did say it, all that stuff is really good. I'm thinking all we needed was a license plate. Of course, license plate number. So I don't know what he's trying to prove. Because this has been four years ago. And then with Darrell Brooks, it only been like a year. Not that that's still in a lot, but four years is even more. I know I couldn't remember what I said yesterday, probably. So that is a problem with some of these witnesses, but I think overall, the end result is still, I believe, from what I saw. But that's just me. But if he said that, he was right to say, don't pursue. And I think that's what everybody's intention was for her to just get the license plate number and... She went a little bit further. Just saying. That's just me. You recall saying that in that interview? That was a general statement of saying that we need a different license plate. We was having a conversation with the detectives and stuff. But I didn't make the statement to her. We was having a conversation. And this is taken out of the content that I was just making a conversation with the detectives. And once again, it was kind of a crazy situation, kind of a hit or miss. You need to make a decision quick. And that decision was get that tag, and she was driving to get it. So you were like, "Good go," and that's all you really said that you heard from me on nine one one, correct? That's what the recording says. Okay. And then if you could go to page nine of your interview with the detectives from May twenty first, two thousand nineteen. That first paragraph of what you were saying. What's that? You just refresh your memory. The first paragraph of when you're responding. Do you recall saying that, please, come on, get back into your truck. You were talking to Mr. Herring, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and you were thinking to yourself, my God, what's taking so long? Why are the police taking so long? Recall that? Yes. And that's when he began, began walking up and down close to his car, looking at his car, correct? Again, he was walking around, sir. Okay. I wasn't observing really at that. What he was doing, but just making sure that he was safe. And then you said something to the fact that, hopefully you can elaborate this, um, after I guess, he must have saw something get in his truck, and he got back in it. I said, what are you doing? He started his truck up again, began revving it up. He begged him to stop. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. So this is different than what you wrote from the day of the 7th, correct? Well, with me, the, the, the 7th was a brief statement, sir. Okay, a brief, statement. a brief statement. I wasn't trying to elaborate or all to one because what was taking place in happened. And that brief statement was only regarding the incident that you saw, correct? It wasn't taking into account what happened after. Yes, the incident that took place in happened at Clark Howell and Forest Parkway. So all of this additional information of what you thought in your head you were saying came from after seeing the aftermath and seeing what had occurred from 
that 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 day, correct? Yes, sir. I couldn't believe what took place and happened. That was, that was my reaction. And of course, you uh, you also uh, recall at the very bottom page of nine that. saying Miss pa Miss Payne's behavior was as far well as I say. She was just looking like, wow, what happened? What's going on? Is this guy okay? Is he drunk? Did you at any time during that period of time, the incident of the first accident, ever make an implication or ever say he was impaired or drunk in the presence of Miss Payne or Mr. Kimball. I don't recall that we was in a conversation. I don't recall this particular statement right here. I don't recall that other than us having a conversation of what was going on with the particular driver. But you do recall whether it's in your statement there, whether it's on the novel. You do recall asking Mr. Heron if he needed an ambulance, correct? That's correct. And you asked him on more than one or twice, two or three times, correct? In the statement. And his response sometimes mm -hmm. were, I didn't do anything wrong, what laws have I broke? Do you recall that being a response when you asked if he needed an ambulance? I know he says that he made that statement, and right there, yes. As I'm saying, this was this report right there. Okay. And you said also that you talked to Mr. Kimball, and Mr. Kimball was standing by, and when you asked him if he needed an ambulance, he said he was good. Correct? That's correct. But then he was saying, wow, is there something wrong with this guy? Is he drunk or something? Do you recall him saying that to you? I believe that was in the conversation. Yeah. So now, again, we was, we was in the conversation. Okay. Now, um, you come lower on to say, did you notice that Miss Payne had any firearms on her? And you said, no, I didn't see a weapon on her. Do you recall that? Yes. I, and I, I wasn't really looking for a weapon. I didn't recall her having a weapon on her. And you recall also later on in your interview that you said it was kind of ironic or weird that you saw Miss Payne coming down, make sure I said this right, coming down 285, y'all were together, and all of a sudden when you came back on Clark Howe, she was behind you. That would be the last day, page number 16. Yeah, I went to I said I was coming from Camp, Camp Creek, and that's when I noticed I seen the vehicle because I see it was a, I mean, a purple, I believe. It's you, pink and black. Pink. Yes. One of the colors on that nature and stuff, but indeed, other than that, when we and it ended up just, just like any occurrence, we wonder like, well, this other vehicle is here. So that was basically it. I, I didn't think nothing other other than that, other than saying that yes, the vehicle is right there. So it's fair to say that. With all these accidents going on, you were trying to find an alternative route to get to where you're going, and it appeared Miss Payne was kind of either following you or somewhere close by trying to find the same alternative I'm, route to avoid all the traffic. I'm not, well, I know that we, I was avoiding trying to get away, get home and make my way with a route that I could feel that I can take this route, and if she was on the same road, she was there. And you never made a stop on your route when you were going, correct? You didn't stop off no. again. I just made my way around and to where I was and where the incident occurred. And she was kind of close by, so it's fair to say she didn't make any stops anywhere because she was right behind you or close by you on this alternative route. Correct? Not that I know of. Okay. And again, you weren't involved in the accident. You only witnessed it from not where the location you pointed out, but the other location, the Clark Howe and Forest Parkway, correct? That's correct. Clark Howe and Forest Parkway. And you 
stayed there until the police came? I stayed until the police came. Yeah, and thank you for your service to know that. Um, and no one else got injured or hurt there at the uh, first location? No, sir. And you said that you work at the medical, or you, you worked around medical uh, inmates, or when you're a correctional officer, you see those that have been diagnosed with uh, disorders, with diabetes, or other medical conditions. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you have any kind of training in that field, or do you just go off what is being told from the, the nurses or the medical department? The medical department. When they say what's taking place with that person, uh, I'm not a medical profession. Um, this this makes sure the place is secure, make sure that um, the nurses and doctors are secure. So it's fair to say that if somebody didn't identify uh, a medical condition, one of the inmates, you couldn't just ready available give a diagnosis by seeing them. Oh, no. Okay. We can't do that. All right. And do you happen to know what the characteristics are of uh, diabetic coma or shock? I've seen some things take place, but other than when they tell us that this person is going through, a professional would tell us that this person is going through a shock, or going through a diabetic shock, or going through a heart attack, having a seizure, and that nature of stuff. That's when they tell us what's taking place and happening. The professionals tell us that. I didn't, would not ever tell us something that first, other than something's wrong with this particular person, and ask for the nurse or someone for assistance. Okay, so it's fair to say that... You're not qualified to just see actions of one person to make a diagnosis, correct? No, sir. Again, I don't. No. Robinson, I'm going to refer to the same interview that Attorney Tucker was referring to on page four in your last paragraph. You want to review that to refresh your memory? Page four? Yes. The last paragraph? Yes. And when you spoke with Detective Moore and Detective Hayward on May 21st of 2019, you indicated that as you were turning the corner um, as an officer, you decided to stop even though you were off. Um, when you saw Mr. Herring, you saw him slumped over. The car came to a creep. As the car came to a slow creep, you got out and checked to see if he was okay. You asked him if he was okay and everything like that. He seemed to be a little impaired. I could tell by his face and working in the infirmary, you kind of get a feel for how these guys look when something is wrong. So on May 21st, 2019, you did inform detectives that you believed that there was something wrong with Mr. Herring at the scene of the first incident. Yes. And that was due to your experience and training in working at the infirmary? Yes. And also on page 11, paragraph 4. You can read that for me and refresh your memory. Say paragraph 4. Yes. Where it says he was walking pretty normal. Correct. You don't have to read it out loud, just review it. Okay.
Yes, ma'am. And Detective Moore asked you if you noticed, was he walking okay? Was he walking in circles? Was he stumbling or anything? Or was he walking pretty normally? Um, you notified Detective Moore that he was walking pretty normal, mm -hmm. but he reminded you of a person like you would, like from when I was working in the infirmary and stuff. These guys, you know, when you're a diabetic and you go into shock and your mindset, you know, that's what it reminded me of. He kept asking me what day it was and stuff like that. And I said, okay, sir. Yeah. So was it your observation of Mr. Robinson that he was having a medical condition? I felt like he was. I mean, again. Yeah, but if he's been around it and experienced but, and seen uh, it. Yeah, I believe my question was, was he suffering from a medical condition? I never stated what that condition was. See the expression of the other DA? Diagnosed, but he has experience as in working with the Georgia Department of Corrections for eight years in the infirmary. That if a nurse identifies what a person is going through, that he has witnessed that over a long period of time, that he would be able to identify it as is currently occurring. Not a diagnosis, but he can recognize those symptoms of the person going through that particular condition. And he would be qualified to state if that's what he observed on May 7th of 2019. already in motion. Hey, but again, it happened pretty fast. Once he started, yes. So you didn't direct the defendant to get in her vehicle? No, I didn't. And you didn't direct her to get in her vehicle and go get the tag? You didn't say get in your vehicle and go get the tag? No, I did not. The defendant was already in motion? Yes. Now, we talked about defense, defenses, I believe, exhibit one, which was your written statement. Defense, defendants, exhibit two, which was a copy of your written statement. Yes. Now, how long have you been an officer, a correction officer? At that time, that was in my like four years, five Almost on about four, four, fifth, going on for about five years at that time. And when you wrote this statement, did you believe there would be further investigation in this case? Yes. And so you would have written what you believed to be, would have been important in what happened at that time, correct? Yes. With the understanding that she would still speak with other investigators in this case? Yes. And you did do that on May 21st of 2019? Yes. And you recalled everything that you remembered from the incident that occurred on May 7th, 2019 in that particular interview? Yes. And you would have given them all the information that you would have recalled that happened on May 7th of 2019? Yes. Is there anything significantly different from your written statement and what you provided to the detectives on May 21st of 2019? 
list of everything what was written there and written here, I mean, and clarify what was said and done or what I can recall at that time period. So you're stating that a person that walks around irritable and is asking, did I break the law? Am I breaking the law? Those are signs of diabetes or diabetes shock. I guess, no, I didn't say that. Okay, but that's what you saw, correct? Again, sir, as he was making a movement, I felt something was wrong with this individual. I didn't state that. When did you find out that there was a possible diabetes or diabetic shock? When did you find out about that? I didn't state that, sir. I'm asking you when you did find out about it. Did you hear from the media? Did you hear from the detectives? Did you hear from investigators? No, sir, I didn't hear from no one that. So you never once heard that there was a possible diabetes uh, that was involved in this? No, sir. Okay, so then your contention is when you see somebody walking around, irritable, saying, I didn't break any laws, I'm going to drive off, see something in the vehicle, crank it up, and almost run over Mr. Kimball, that's a sign of diabetes or diabetes uh, coma? No, sir, I, again, I didn't make that say, but I, again, his looking... The look that he had on his face, I didn't say that this person was doing the following thing, saying they was going through that. I just said the look he had on his face reminded me of something like that. But you refreshed your memory from the statement you gave on the 21st, correct? Mm -hmm. And you re remember on page 5 you said he was walking around irritable. And further on in that in in interview, you said he was asking, I didn't break any crime, what, cr what laws did I break? Do you recall those? Yeah, yeah. And that's all stuff that you saw, that you saw him do, correct? Yes, sir. He was, I was right standing right. That's what I was trying to tell him that when I made the statement right here. And you were telling him not to get back in his vehicle, correct? At the time, because of the vehicle doing what it was doing, yes. Okay. And you're stating that those are characteristics from your experience training and seeing individuals in the infirmary? That that is signs of a diabetic shock or coma? Just my opinion. But I kind of feel like Attorney Tucker is a bit like Darrell hammering away like a woodpecker in a petrified forest asking the same question over and over again and maybe trying to twist it a little. Of course, I know that both sides both sides do that, and that's probably like a technique. But there's just something about the way that he does it. He's just, um, I don't know. He's really got, well, again, my opinion. He's got nothing. Well, I don't think he does. We'll see. No, sir. I can't. I can't make those particular um, diagnoses again that remind me of something. Like, again, his facial features that I remind me of. I just say, that, again, that will remind me of. Now, you're post-certified, correct? Yes, sir, I am. And when you do all this training for post-certification, you're very clear about writing reports, correct? Yes, sir. And that anything, anything is important that you feel is important and you think might be important down the road. You need to memorialize it in your report, correct? We try to do those particular things. Sometimes I hit and miss. And you say you didn't put stuff that was important in your statement because you figured somebody would follow up with it? Well, again, when writing reports, so you give the details of then, 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 hope, then later on there should be, a, there will be, hopefully there will be investigations afterwards. So you anticipated there was going to be an investigation after you wrote your report and after the police showed up to take care of that accident? What's the accident you're saying? The one that you witnessed, the only one you witnessed, the 18-wheeler and Mr. Herring. This still what happens when the incident occurs. They do investigations. I assume that's what takes place and happen. Was about officer believe was anything that takes place there is an investigation afterwards. Now, you started off your, 
your um, testimony here with a diagram that you didn't give the exact location of this accident, correct? That you witnessed. The diagram showing there is where the incident, the other incident occurred. I stated that I came from the other incident down to incident that took place afterwards. You don't recall being asked, is this where the 18 wheeler and the truck had an accident? Um, they took, no, as we said, it, that the accident was occurred at Forest Parkway and Clark Hollow. That's what I stated. The Clark accident happened with Forest Park and Clark Hollow. As I looked at that particular, and I stated that this is the McDonald's, this is where 285 and everything. I didn't state that that particular incident happened there. The first incident happened there. The first incident happened at Clark Hollow and Forest Parkway. And you didn't see the second incident. You just came up after it, correct? Came up afterwards. And you said that <clears throat> I asked previously if you saw that she had a phone in her hand or that you knew she was on 911 on the call when Miss Payne was driving her uh, Jeep past you. I didn't see her okay. on the call. But you felt compelled to say, good, go. Because you are on the phone with 911 trying to get the tag, correct? That's correct. Okay, and if, if somebody in, uh, who's identified themselves as a correctional officer is asking somebody to take a picture of the tag and here somebody else is going to get a tag, says, good, good, go. You don't think that was a form of encouragement? To go to get, get the tag or take a picture of the take tag? Take a picture of the tag? We need Again, I didn't have a picture of the tag. I was just, again, they would need to fix up the tag until afterwards. That's when Mr. Kimball said, hey, here's a picture, here's a picture. That's when we then were able to give them clarity of the tag. But at that moment, you felt it was important to get a picture of that tag or to get some way to identify that vehicle, correct? Yes, because the person was fleeing the incident. And this person was fleeing the incident, having walked around his car, having walked around asking about breaking laws, and appeared, as you said, irritable. Yes. And at no time did you feel that you needed to take the keys out of the truck because you thought the truck was not going to move or was disabled. Yes, sir. Well, that was a interesting first day with the first two witnesses. Mr. Robinson being probably one of the primary witnesses. And he had a long day or yeah, a long day afternoon of testifying. And I mean, as far as attorney Tucker, I mean, he definitely has his work cut out in trying to convince the jury of Hannah's innocence. I mean, he kind of reminds me of Darrell, I guess with a little more education, but like that. 
woodpecker in a petrified forest, just pecking, pecking, pecking. Just like when he said that Mr. Robinson told Hannah, Good go, good go, good go, good go, good go, go after the tag. Okay, so even if he said go after the tag, he did not say go and try to go in hot pursuit of Mr. Herring and and nearly wreck everyone and then cut him off and get out of your car and confront him. That's where things get crazy. It doesn't matter that he, I mean, he was irritable. Um, if he was sick, people are irritable and he was confused. It really didn't matter at that point what the situation was. She, I guess that's my big thing. At the end of the day, Hannah still pursued him, put herself in that situation. She shouldn't have been leaning up on his truck. And having the gun was really, really bad. That's just me. But, yeah, um, Attorney Tucker is really going to be one of the ones to look at. Of course, it'll be interesting when Hannah testifies to see how her demeanor is. I really haven't seen a lot of that part. But I tell you what, Judge Scott, I can't get over her voice. It's just so soothing and it's like silk. It's like, I almost feel like even if some, even if she was giving someone a, a really dreadful sentence, she would be able to deliver it in a way that sounded good. Like, you know, if she said something like, well, I will sentence you to 30 years with the possibility of parole. You almost could sit there and if you just added in there, you know, um, but you will have a sauna in there and a garden tub. It almost just, I just feel like, you know, you might think, oh, well, maybe that sentence isn't too bad by the way she delivered it. You know, that's just me being silly. But, but yeah, she really has such a calm voice. I wonder if she'll stay calm. I think she does. Anyhow, well, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this. The next one will provide us with more witnesses for the state. I honestly don't think Hannah has any witnesses I mean, for them, the defense, other than her getting up and testifying. So that will be something to look forward to. I know we have, like, the next one might be somebody who worked, I don't know, in dispatch with the 911 people, all that kind of stuff. I can't remember, but it's sure to be interesting. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for now. You know what to do. Well, first... Thank you so much for watching, commenting, and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, go on and do it because it doesn't cost you a thing. And be kind to yourself. Nope, let's get it right. Be kind to everyone else. Be kind to you. Remember, I love you. And I'll see you all the next time.